Between the villages of West Bexington and Osmington there runs an ancient ridgeway that to this day is known as the Land of Bone and Stone. Since the earliest days of humankind the South Dorset Ridgeway has functioned as fortress, trade route and burial ground for all those peoples that have called the area home. Given the sheer number of barrows, tumuli, hill forts, earthworks and standing stones that pepper the place, it's easy for the exceptional to appear mundane. Nevertheless, there is one monument that stands out above all. Just north of the village of Portisham, not too far from the monument built to memorialise Admiral Hardy, lies the Hellstone. Experts today will tell you it's nothing more than an ancient Neolithic barrow containing the long dead bones of some ancient person of import. Then again though, one of such experts ever deigned to listen to the common country folk of any land, or pay any heed to the tales they've told for centuries. Bones it does indeed contain, for it is a long barrow of sorts, but also something far more important. As the cunning folk would tell you, had their numbers not dwindled and their knowledge not faded to all but an echo, the pathways we build in our world are mirrored in the shadowlands that lay beyond the veil that divides us. These pathways allow time and experience to fold in on itself, and in so doing bring the two worlds closely together. So, should a soul ever perish and be buried along these pathways, you'd best wish that they cross over with no vengeance or fury in their hearts. For if they do, their rumbling disquiet is sure to seek a path back to the living. On their own there's little they can do, but should a thousand of them spend a thousand years scratching at the veil between worlds, sooner or later one of them is bound to make a hole somewhere. Back in the days when England was still known as Albion and the beings the Celts would later worship as gods were little more than mischievous youths, the Ridgeway had already seen the passing of generations and the fall of more than one human species. Thus the Shadowland Trail that mirrored it was already fit to bursting, ready to disgorge itself upon the sunlit world as soon as the opportunity presented itself. It was well known, even in those days, that there were certain spirit nights when the barriers between worlds were thinner than usual and communing with ancestors was a little easier than it would normally be. Eventually we would come to know one of these nights as Samain, and latterly as All Hallows' Eve. It was already well known that on this night gifts of food and drink should be left out for the wandering spirits, lest they visit their displeasure upon the living. But on this night they would not be so easily quelled, nor would they retreat come daybreak. As soon as the last light of day dwindled from the sky, a fissure was torn in the veil, a gaping rent that spewed forth the scratchers that stood behind it. Unlike the wanderers that would visit during the spirit nights, these creatures did not inhabit ephemeral spirit bodies that could be warned away with St. John's wart or talismans carved from bone. These beasts ventured forth in twisted flesh, corrupted by rage and fury. A sickening grey-green in colour, and bereft of any features that would remind you of their origins. In place of eyes were slug-like stalks, and in place of mouths there stretched bloody caverns torn into misshapen heads lined with rotten fangs. It didn't take them long to find the first village, although one day it would be the site of a great abbey, full of piety and holy men, that night it was without divine protection. So the things descended and they had their fun. Babes were taken as succulent snacks while maidens were ravaged and men were roasted alive over bale fires. Come morning the creatures were exhausted from the barbarity they had inflicted and collapsed together into an undulating mass of warped and rotten tissue, waiting until nightfall to begin their festivities once more. Weeks this lasted, weeks of fiendish assaults and nightly terrors until the chieftains that had survived the onslaught gathered the wisest of all that remained and begged them for a solution. Although those gathered were not yet known as druids, this is what they'd eventually become, and so this meeting could be considered their very first conclave. Although they wore no robes and carried no sickles, each of them knew the spirit world, and often conversed with those beings that would one day be revered as gods. They knew the power of herb lore and of symbols carved in stone, and so soon enough they offered a solution. One day, once the creatures that plagued them had dissolved into their fleshy nest, 
they carried five great stones up to the site where the Hellstone now stands. Here they used branches of white willow to divine the position of the rift, and once found they constructed a doorway around it. Once the stones were placed, the wise men and wise women of the conclave surrounded it, and holding boughs of holly and mistletoe, began chanting their commands. Low at first, in a rumbling whisper that caused the air to sting, then louder and more insistent until finally it became a command that even the clouds in the sky and the trees in the forests could not ignore. As their chanting continued, the earth beneath the stones began to fissure and crack, steam and dust swirling as stone and soil became a vortex of sucking liquid. In their slumbering state, the creatures did not notice as the air in the earth slowly teased the revolting mass they had become into thin, searching tendrils and guided them imperceptibly towards the vortex. Beyond it lay not the shadowland from whence it had come, but a darker place, a harsher place, a place with no hope or joy or grace, where pleasure and relief are myths designed to torment and escape is all but impossible. There have been many names for it over the years. Hades, Tartarus, Abaddon, Sheol, Gehanna, Avernus, Perdition, the Abyss, but you probably know it best as hell. So, there they were cast down and there they were sealed. To ensure against their escape, the tribe's strongest warrior was brought forth. Beneath the stones, he was feasted and vaunted and granted the favour of any young maiden he wished. Then he was dressed in the finest clothes, given the sharpest spear and the strongest shield, before being bade to kneel in front of the stones and the pit that had been dug for him. They needed a guardian, see. One to keep watch over the things trapped inside so that none could escape and wreak their havoc again. And none did. Well, at least not until a few years back. It's an unfortunate fact, but even the strongest doors and the strongest locks eventually get old and rickety. Especially if they're not looked after. And all it takes is one moment of clumsiness to fall through them. None of us are immune to clumsiness but there are those who are more predisposed to it. One such individual came to Dorset the year that the Covid lockdown was first eased. Like many others of her ilk, she considered herself an influencer, although who or what she thought she was influencing I couldn't tell you. For some reason known only to herself, she had taken to writing her Instagram handle on various landmarks and areas of outstanding natural beauty. The week before she had joined the onslaught of tourists, or grockles as they're known down here, the defiled Dirtle Door, and had graced the limestone cliffs with her graffiti. Unabashed, she then decided to take her Sharpie and her smartphone up to the Ridgeway to see what she could see. After all, she was staying in a holiday cottage just outside Portisham at the time, so she was certainly close enough. I don't know whether she was looking for the Hellstone, but when she found it, she couldn't resist. For that, I can't really blame her. In the early evenings, when the sunlight shines through the stones, it's certainly a magical sight, and I have no doubt she saw the chance for a perfect picture to post to her profile. So she took her pen, she wrote her handle, and she took her photo. And that's the last that was ever seen of her. When she failed to return, the friends that she was staying with informed the police, and soon enough a search was launched. They found little, of course. No body, no clothes, no jewellery but they did eventually find her phone, right in the middle of the Hellstone. The police were hoping for some clues as to her whereabouts, but all they found were the strangest set of pictures. There she was in the foreground, a selfie suitable smile stretched across her face, while behind her there stood an indistinct figure with what might have been a spear, holding back the inhuman hand that was reaching out towards her. Of course, I can't be sure where she ended up, she certainly may have been dragged down to the pit in order to satisfy the appetites of those foul things trapped within. On the other hand, she may have just caught a sight of them and run for her life. Either way, there are those that say that ever since that summer they can hear the strangest sound coming from those stones any time the early evening light shines through them. Not screaming exactly, more a muffled indistinct pleading that vanishes with the light. So if you ever do find yourself up on the South Dorset Ridgeway, it might be a good idea to admire the Hellstone from afar.